Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. And now, here's Bill Bullington. Yes, indeed. <laughs> hey, feel free to call us 216-901-0945. If you'd like to ask any questions about investing or retirement planning, financial planning in general, which is a lot simpler than the vast majority of planners want to make it seem. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. No big deal. The, uh, I just like to keep things as simple as humanly possible. And uh, that's how I like to run my show. Just keep it as simple as possible. And that's not easy to do in my industry because they really like to make things complicated. They love complexity. Why use a one-syllable word when a five-syllable word sounds much, so much more eloquent? <laughs> and uh, so we're not going to do that here. Feel free to call us 216-901-0945 if you have any questions. And I do want to uh, start off by talking about the upcoming seminar. That's going to be coming up relatively soon. Uh, it's Thursday, March 8th. It's, and in the title is Estimating the Impact of a Financial Crisis on Your Investments. How do, you, how do your investments perform in a crisis? How did your investments perform over the last three weeks or so? I can tell you that if you were running a balanced account, your account was down nowhere near where the stock market was. Not even close. Yeah, if you're 100% stock, you're probably going, whoa, that's pretty rough. Yep, it is. And managing risk, incidentally, is the most important thing when it comes to portfolio management. It is. It's the most important thing. And for a long time, just like a lot of other people in my industry, I always thought that it was performance. You got to have the highest performance. Well, no, actually that performance comes at a cost. That cost is higher risk. And if you're going to include stocks in your portfolio and, and they're reasonably logically selected, over time, you're going to do fairly well. But the, but the big thing is you don't want to take on too much risk. And that's hard for a lot of people to evaluate really hard for them to evaluate. Now we're looking at a new tool. Hopefully by the time the seminar is there, I'll, I'll uh, be up to speed on it. But it's a tool that will take your portfolio and show you exactly how much risk you're taking. How about that? Because that is the key. The risk is the key. The return is secondary. And I know nobody understands that. Well, some people do. But I mean, the vast majority of the investing public thinks that return is the single most important factor. And I got news for them. The things that return the most have the highest volatility level. So you've got to be able to put up with a lot of fluctuation if you want to make a lot of money. Now, at some point in time earlier in my career, that wasn't nearly as true as it is today. Today, it's incredibly true. Back then, it was a lot easier to manage risk. It was, by the way, the thing that changed all that are the uh, robots, you know, exchange traded funds. Those are funds that are run by computers. People are not involved in those. And it's been the dominant source of uh new funds coming into the market. Well, actually they've been the, the beneficiary of the new funds coming into the market because most of the money over the past five or six years has come in to exchange traded funds. Those are funds you can buy and sell during the day like a stock, but instead of buying a stock, you're buying a basket of stocks in uh, uh, that's been dominating and it's kind of changed the way the market works. It, it has, uh, it's not that it works. It, the thing, old things didn't work, don't work. They just don't work like they used to. Some of them don't work nearly as well. Some of them work a little bit better. So that's what we're going to talk about. You know, the ones that work better, are they going to stay that way? I don't know. I don't really know. I can tell you what's working right now. And I can tell you when its effectiveness starts to wear off, but I can't tell you exactly when. 
And that's one of the things you have to get used to when you're making investments is not knowing the future. You can't know the future exactly. And everybody wants to do that. It's just amazing. And the less they know about investments, the more they think that that's easy to do. <laughs> Somebody knows a lot about investments, knows exactly what I'm talking about. They're, you know, wherever they are, they're shaking their head right now going, yep, that's right. That's right. Somebody doesn't know anything goes, oh, this other guy said he knows exactly where the market's going. Well, you will find out one of these days. You'll find out. Truth doesn't need defending. And the truth, by the way, and experience, they're good teachers. They're the best teachers, in fact. But they're very strict. They're very painful. <laughs> I'd love to learn from experience, especially when it's somebody else's experience. Well, I don't have to go through that all on my own, although we still do. Still do. But the good news is and a financial crisis doesn't have to be the end of your investing career. It doesn't mean you have to go back to CDs and, and work until you die. Okay. You can go through, you can come through a financial crisis if you have a good plan. And uh, let me uh, share a little bit of something that I just uh, saw this week. It was another kind of take on something that I've been talking about for years. I used to talk about the peak to trough decline in the recovery period. How far do you go down? How long does it take to get back up to make that money back? That becomes increasingly important as you age. When you're up past the age of 50, you don't want a 10-year period with a negative return. Actually, nobody wants that, but especially people beyond the age of 50. You really want to go 10 years and have a negative return. Is that what you want to do? By the way, that's the thing that's made the most money over the past five years, that thing that has that 10-year drought. Can you afford that? Can you afford to do that? What if somebody told you that it wasn't necessary, that you could actually get better returns in the long run if you're willing to underperform in the short run? Think about that for a second. And that, that's the number one reason the average investor doesn't do well. They don't want to underperform ever. <laughs> they always want to be out front. It, they don't understand that it's not necessary, nor is it probable. It's not very likely that that's going to happen. So you're going to get disappointed there in most cases. Secondly, it's not necessary. So you're really fretting over nothing. How much better would you feel if you knew you didn't have to beat the market on the way up? How much better would you feel? How much better would you feel knowing that, hey, if the market goes down, I'm not going to go down anywhere near as much. How much better would you sleep at night knowing that it's not going to wipe me out? How much better would you feel if you're taking money out of your account that you knew you didn't have to worry about touching your stocks for five years minimally because you already had that money socked away in something that's stable and that's what you're going to use for income while the stocks fluctuate. How much better would you feel? I think you'd feel a lot better. In fact, we're, we're covering all this in a seminar. And like I said, it's not that, it's really not that complicated. It's not that complicated. In 2018, Wow, <laughs> I almost said 2008. The, uh, yep, <laughs> I'm getting old. The uh, 2018 is going to be the year. There, I am so pumped because there are so many concepts that can be put onto a video, a 90-second video. A 90-second video or less, okay, 90 seconds or less. That's my goal. I'm going to take all the big really important financial concepts that, that you really need to know about to be able to be successful financially. It, now, notice I'm not saying all the concepts that you could know because that's like saying all the things that you could know about a computer. Do you know how many millions of things there are that you could know about computers? <laughs> you don't need to know all that to be able to use a computer. You don't need to know how to fix your car to be able to drive it. I can't fix my car. I drive pretty well, I think, but the, uh, so here's the thing to be successful financially. There are certain things that you have to know, but you don't have to know everything. And what are those things that you, you need to know? I'm going to put 90 second videos. That's, that's, that's my goal. We're moving our offices, by the way, uh, only about a mile away from where we are now. And, uh, per usual, the, you know, some of the equipment that's supposed to have been there this week didn't show up. So we're still waiting. Once that's done, it's going to take us 
two days max to be able to uh, move all that stuff, but it has pushed a lot of stuff back. So and the reason I'm saying this is that I promised some people some information, uh, some research, and boy, the farther I got into the research, the more interesting it got, by the way, but the more work it became. So I'm still not done. And the research is regarding semiconductor stocks. It's the semiconductor industry. Revenues in the semiconductor industry in the United States were up 40% year over year. That's pretty good. That's really good. 40% increase in one year in revenue. That, that's pretty wild. What's really interesting is that the prices of the leading stocks in those categories were only up in the 30s. So the revenue growth is growing faster than the actual share price appreciation. That's a good thing. When your sales are going up faster than your share price is going up, I know you will, the, if, if you're invested in it, you're going, oh, that should be, they should, I should get more money. Well, be happy that you made over 30%, first of all, the, uh, in that particular sector. Secondly, sooner or later, it's going to catch up and probably at some point in time, it's going to get ahead of itself. We're not completely there yet. There are a couple companies that they're there yet, and, uh, but we're not completely there. And when I'm done with the research, I'm going to send it out to everybody. Uh, all my clients, I'm going to send it out to everyone. I'm going to have showed up at that seminar, which is Thursday, March 8th, uh, estimating the impact of a financial crisis. If you're going to invest in an industry, a specific industry, it's going to fluctuate more than if you were investing in a broad uh, list of industries. If you have more industries and it's actually the diversification helps calm the fluctuations down a little bit. So anyway, uh, we look at how well this is doing and what is happening in that industry. That's a good thing. You're going to want to see that research. You, you really will. If you're a client, you're, you'll be getting it sometime next week. And I apologize for not being able to get out this week. Uh, it got to be a lot more than I thought it was. That's for sure. So, and also the, uh, I need, I owe somebody a, a sheet on the bond portfolios that we were talking about last week, the loans, senior bank loans. I think that's a good place to be right now with a portion of your fixed income. Fixed income, those are things that, you know, like bonds. Uh, bonds are things that have guarantees on them. Um, by the way, when you put a bond into a fund, you've actually turned it into a stock. It, it generally doesn't fluctuate as much as stocks do, but it does fluctuate. It, depending on the types of bonds you're investing in, it could fluctuate almost as much as stocks do. High yield bonds fluctuate almost as much as stocks do. The, uh, High quality, short term government backed, government issued or bank loans, they tend not to fluctuate nearly as much as stocks do. And right now they have interest rates that are pretty attractive. I mean, you're talking about three and a half percent, which, you know, compared to a money market or a CD, it's pretty good. Uh, are they going to fluctuate? Little. The better they're managed, the, the smaller the fluctuation. Uh, and this is where the size of the fund can be a real help a smaller fund is much more flexible than a larger fund so uh anyway we talked about that last week and I, again i apologize not having been able to get that information out uh it'll be there by monday night if i have to uh sleep all night at my office on sunday <laughs> it'll be there by monday night so we're going to talk about how we incorporate that how do you put that together how do you put that together in a portfolio? How do you put that together so that the next time a financial crisis comes along that you don't panic and sell along with a whole bunch of other people who will never get that money back? They've missed one of the biggest opportunities in their lives. And you, there are no do-overs. There are no mulligans in the stock market. You miss it, you miss it. Financial markets in general. If You miss those things, you miss them. So... How do you prepare for this? There are ways. There are ways to prepare for it. There are ways of reducing the amount of drawdown or the amount of decline in your portfolio value. And think about this for a second. I think, uh, how many minutes we have before a uh, commercial break? Mm -hmm. uh, three? Okay. So I'm going to uh, take the next three minutes right before commercial break and, and cover this idea. We'll cover it again right after the commercial break too and in the last portion of, of today's show because this is a really important concept. To Get this one down. You go into the front of the class. So here's the concept. A, an investment, a portfolio that only goes down half as much 
as the S&P 500 can make, can uh, actually when the S&P 500 recovers, it can get beaten by the S&P by a two to one margin and still come out ahead. So the S&P 500 can go down 50%, you're down 25%. By the time the S&P 500 gets back to its original starting place, you will be ahead by 12%, even if you only caught half of the gain. Think about that. You should feel really good about that. Now, I'm going to come back after the commercial break in a couple minutes with some numbers to prove that that is true. It'll prove that's true. And I'm, I'm sorry for taking this uh, tone of voice. I just, I get excited. <laughs> I get excited when uh, somebody points something out to me. And, you know, I used to talk about peak to chaff, recovery time. That was important. Now we've got some tools at this next seminar I'm going to be able to use that will actually be able to illustrate that more readily. And more importantly, this concept of not having to beat the market, that's a big one. You don't have to beat the market in the short run to beat it in the long run. In fact, it's kind of like the uh, Song of the South. Remember that movie? Uh, Rabbit and the Hare. Or, I'm sorry, the Hare and the Turtle. Was that, was that in that movie? I don't know. I think it was. The Tortoise and the Hare. The, uh, somebody can remind me. <laughs> Anyway, the, the, the concept is being the fastest isn't always the best. And in most cases, avoiding risk is more important than getting outsized returns. It's the money that you don't lose, that you don't have to make back up again when the market goes up that puts you ahead. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal, particularly when the fastest growing segment of the United States population is 62 and over every day. 10,000 people are, are becoming eligible for Social Security every day. The number one concern on their minds is running out of money before they die. So the good news is we're going to be specifically talking about that from this point on. By the way, when you're young, this helps you accumulate more assets with, while taking less risk as well. And we'll get more into that after these commercial messages. You're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420 The Answer. Stay tuned. Welcome back. If you'd like to ask a question, 216-901-0945. I have to apologize too. I don't have the uh, my charts up on my computer this morning. That, that really kind of bothers me, but um, that's because it, it doesn't play well with Apple for some reason. The uh, it's, uh, it's amazing, but so I don't have a lot of that to talk about. And, and we are going to be, uh, well, this year is going to be such a good year. I, I'm just, I can feel it. Um, the some stocks are overpriced. There's, there's no doubt about it. They're overpriced, but they're not all stocks. And it's not a huge percentage of all the stocks that make up the stock market. So that's very promising for somebody like me. And, and even the stocks that are ahead of themselves, um, they're a big chunk of the S&P, by the way. And, and in fact, they're one of the, uh, they've been the biggest contributors to the performance of the S&P 500 which has beaten a lot of stuff uh, over the past four or five years. And uh, it's kind of a, man, this is a broken record. It just keeps replaying over and over and over again. Um, I would be real careful about adding to the S&P 500. Now, other stocks, other funds have lower risk and, and have better valuations, meaning they're selling cheaper than you know the, the stocks that make up the S&P 500. They're selling for less money. What do I mean by that? And in fact, I am, I'm working right now on some video that it's going to be out. It'll be out shortly, somewhere over the next three months or so, which is shortly in, <laughs> in, in my terms. But the, uh, and it's going to explain that. And it's going to explain how you can take a look at holdings in a fund that you're interested in. And you can kind of get an, an idea of how risky that fund is. Think about that for a second. You could look up the holding, the top holdings in a fund, which 
is pretty easy to do now. You can do there's tons of sources on the internet that allow you to do that. So if you could look up the top holdings and you saw that a fund that made up more than 10% of that fund was selling for more than twice what it should be. Now think about that. A stock that makes up more than 10% of a fund that you're interested in is selling for more than twice what it should be. So when it goes back to normal, that fund is going to be down by 5% because of that one stock. That is what you want to try to avoid. <laughs> and those are the types of things we're going to be talking about at that workshop, at the seminar. How do you do that? How do you look those things up? I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you exactly where you can go. And you can look that kind of stuff up because it's important. It's going to have an impact on, could have an impact on the rest of your life. And uh, uh, it's interesting too. I, at least I think it's interesting. How does that happen? How does a company get so far ahead of itself? How does a stock sell for more than it should normally sell for? Well, there are lots of reasons for it. One of the biggest reasons is because the stock market, uh, the, the most popular funds are weighted by size, not by economic value. Uh, and by economic value, I got to find a new word for that. Warren Buffett used to call it intrinsic value. He still does. The, uh, but basically, how much is this thing worth to somebody? It's a very easy calculation, by the way. Unless you, uh, you know, unless you go to college, if you have a PhD behind you, your name, you're, it, nothing is easy for you. <laughs> you feel obligated to make it more complicated than it needs to be because it's how you had to get your PhD. <laughs> yeah, not all of them, by the way. Not all, there are a lot of I know a lot of PhDs who were uh, very pragmatic, very simple in their explanations, and uh, but uh, you know it's. It's a byproduct, too, of the educational system. So that being said, economic value. Here's a simple one for you. Just take the uh, long-term average of the 10-year treasury. It's 5%. And divide the earnings per share by 5%. There you go. Now you don't have to finish that finance degree. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The, uh, if you take that model and you apply it to stocks over time and you you refuse to pay more than twice the, that value that you get. Uh, in fact, the closer you pay to that value and the more higher quality the companies are that you're investing, what's high quality? That's a company that has relatively stable earnings. Like look at a company like Tootsie Roll. They still fluctuate. Look at uh, Colgate Palmolive or Procter & Gamble. They still fluctuate, but they don't fluctuate anywhere near as much as say Ford or General Motors, those things really fluctuate like a lot by billions of dollars. So the other companies are more uh, stable. That's more, I uh, like to refer to that as higher quality because the earnings, they don't lose billions one year and make billions the next. Their earnings may be up or down 10 or 15% on average, which is pretty much normal, but they're not up or down several hundred percentage points. Does that make sense? So pretty simple. And, and again, this year, this year's going to be the year. I've, I've been saying this for a long time. We're finally getting closer. I'm going to take some explanations like the one that I just gave. Don't worry. If you missed that, what I just said, I just said, take the earnings per share divided by 5%. That gives you a pretty good idea of what the stock should be selling for. Now, having said that, there are tons of caveats there. There are tons of uh, exceptions to that rule. And I'm putting out a little course on what those exceptions are and how you can adjust, how you can make your adjustment on the estimate of a fair market value. And by the way, you will not even have to have a calculator for much for most of this. You won't even need a calculator. You'll be able to do this in your head. It always confounds people when, uh, especially the uh, analysts, they don't know how I come up with these answers so fast. First of all, I've been doing this for 30 years. Secondly, the, uh, I figured out a shortcut that's typically effective in 85% of the instances you're going to use it in. So 85% of the time somebody calls and says, hey, what about XYZ stock? I'll, I'll look up the uh, sales numbers and I know that in my head I'll do the calculation. And you could do that too. It, it's not um, magic, by the way. Some people think it is. I think it's, I think it's hilarious when some people would uh, hear this and they would go... Um, they would say things like, oh, well, you're just a genius. Nope. <laughs> I promise you, I'm not a genius. 
And you don't need to be a genius to be profitable. That's That should be a big relief to most people. I know it was a relief to me. <laughs> what? You know what I mean? I, I can still make money and I don't need to be a genius? Yeah, awesome. I'm in. What do I need to do? And yeah, we'll take that uh, uh, material. We're going to start presenting that. And I got to, one of these days, I keep saying I'm going to write this, but I, I don't really know if I want to write a book. I think at this point I might just do a, a series of, of short blog posts and videos because realistically, there's really not that much to it. I mean, financial stuff is grossly overcomplicated. And uh, I'm going to try to make that a lot simpler for you. Feel free to give me a call, 216-901-0945 if you have any questions now. 216-901-0945. And we started talking a little bit about uh, what was going on uh, in the economy, uh, particularly with semiconductors. And this is fascinating to me. This is really fascinating to me. The more research that I've done, the more I think I would like to, I, I'd really like to diversify that. And I'd like to make this, I'm going to put about 10% of my, of, of all my money into that particular industry. Now I'm going to do it with a bunch of different strategies. I'm going to use a couple funds and I'm going to use a basket of stocks that I'm selecting myself. And at the seminar, I'm going to show you exactly how I select it. It's not rocket science, actually. Um, but you do have to have a, a fairly uh, expensive subscription to a database. <laughs> that, would, that would help. But you don't have to worry about it because I'm going to put that stuff out there myself. Yeah. In fact, that'll be a model that I'll end up uh, publishing at some point in time. I'll publish that model. Yeah, it's actually being published now. All I did was tweak it one little bit. And when I ran the back test, it improved the performance by about 30%. One little tweak added about 30%. Now, if I tweak it uh, again, I'm going to eliminate a stock from that list of stocks. It makes up about 3% of, of my portfolio, but it makes up over 10% of the fund. I'm pretty sure I'm going to improve the performance a little bit more than that. So that's really cool. And I'm going to go into that in great detail at the seminar. Why? A, because I think it'll make money. B, I think it makes sense. Even for, even for uh, extremely conservative people, so extremely conservative people, maybe instead of putting 10% of your, your total assets in there or 10% of your account value, maybe you only put 3%. Or 4%. Over a 10 year time period. That can make a big difference. Make a huge difference. Because all those stocks by the way. Are already in. The other exchange traded funds. Or actively managed funds. That I'm using. So by when you when you add 3 or 4%. Specifically to those industries. And you already have those stocks. In the funds that you own now. The total exposure to that industry is probably somewhere between five and ten percent, depending on the portfolio. So, adding three or four percent is is actually, uh, or five percent is actually overweighting quite a bit, quite a bit because you already own those stacks in the other funds. And uh, I think that's a uh, something that nobody's really talking about. At least I don't hear them. I listen. I read a lot every day. So these are the types of things that that can help you. And if you're a young person and you're like crazy aggressive, <laughs> you can, you can just invest in those. If you really want to get crazy, okay, do that. In fact, over the past 10 years, you'd be up about 350%. Think about that for a second. And, and by the way, the past 10 years, you're going to 2008. You started off going down like a lot. <laughs> So if, if you were really aggressive and you did this 10 years ago and you started off and you were down 40% in the first five months, think about that for a second. You start, I'm aggressive. I'm aggressive. Oh, okay. <laughs> Here you go. The, uh, and you're down 40% in the first five months. If you didn't quit, if you didn't give up, that index is up 350% from where you started, not from the bottom. So that's that's kind of a big deal. That's a really big deal. 
I'm really happy about this. <laughs> By the way, the uh, I really like this. This is a I'm uh, fascinated. Why am I fascinated? Well, my car, I, and by the way, I don't buy the most expensive cars. Surprise, surprise. The, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking for value. So, But my car has so many computers in it, and it was not the top of the line. It was right in the middle of the road. And in fact, it was uh, uh, had been on their lot for a little bit, so they were willing to negotiate on the price. That, that was nice. So I got this nice car. And I'm looking at all the computer stuff and I'm like, holy cow, this, are you guys sure this is the right price on this guy? I mean, this, this wasn't available in the car that I bought, you know, four and a half years ago and put 125,000 miles on, by the way. <laughs> and incidentally, when you put that kind of mileage on a car, things start breaking. <laughs> and that's actually when I, when I know it's time to trade my car in, when I'm putting a lot of money into my car and I, I, I don't probably put four or $5,000 into my last car. In the last, you know, in the nine months before I figured, okay, yep, it's getting too expensive. Time to upgrade. But I didn't want to go to the top. And I was just shocked by all the technology in the middle of the road type of cars. And that's what I'm talking about. The cars are no longer automobiles. They're computers on wheels. I've got a, uh, I bought a crock pot recently. It wasn't very expensive. It's got a semiconductor in it. It you can program this thing. It'll change program. It's a crock pot and a pressure cooker all in one. And it's unbelievable the thousands of recipes this thing is capable of handling because you can literally program the thing and walk away. That's nuts. Refrigerators, you see the Samsung commercials. They're building computers right into the refrigerator. That's a little spooky, isn't it? The uh Think about your cell phones. Think about the iPads. Think about everything. The semiconductor industry, it used to be extremely cyclical. It's going to be a lot smoother going forward than it has been in the past because they're working their way into everything. And that's that's a good thing for the industry. That's a really good thing. And I don't think it's being fully reflected in the value of the stocks. I'm looking at the stocks in that industry group and I'm going, wow, these are actually pretty good bargains. There are very few of them are hopelessly overpriced. Most of them are moderately or slightly underpriced. That's a good thing. Next 10 years, I think having a little bit more of that in your portfolio, probably, probably going to be a good thing. Probably going to be an excellent thing. But now when I say that, I know I'm going to get phone calls and emails and people are going to go, which one? Um, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to bet on a single stock especially in that particular industry, because it's, uh, it changes so quickly. Your fund has got to have some sort of methodology for selecting those stocks that is based on uh, common sense for a portfolio manager. It might not be common sense for somebody who's never done it before, but a portfolio manager, you know, you know what you're doing. Okay. So you got to have some sort of guidelines for what you're going to do to select those particular stocks. And then you need to follow those and then you need to give it time. And I think, I think it's one of the better opportunities that I've seen in my career. I really do. I remember the uh, internet. Yeah, everybody knew the internet was going to be big. And those stocks got hopelessly overpriced. I bought a lot of those stocks back in the mid 90s when they were reasonably priced. I remember my Christmas wish list from 1996. You know why I remember that? Because it did so well. It was a Christmas wish list I put out to all my clients. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back from these commercial messages. You're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420. Stay tuned because I'll be right back. And we're back. Feel free to call us 216-901-0945, 216-901-0945. And I just wanted to talk again a little bit more about the uh, seminar, and then I'll stop. (laughs) It's coming up on uh, uh, March 8th. That's a Thursday night. There's no cost to attending. I I believe, in fact, I think I know I am. I'm going to give away a a Chromebook by HP. I'm going to give away a Chromebook, and I'll tell you why I'm giving it away. I'm actually getting it there to learn how to use it uh, for myself. 
and uh, um, because I'm pretty sure that all the things that I do, people can get access to on a Chromebook, and I want to make sure that they can. So it will be slightly used, <laughs> just a little bit. But I was looking at it. It's over at Best Buy. It's made by HP. It looks really good. I mean, it's cool. The uh, I'm really cool. So we're going to do a drawing for that. Uh, there's no cost to this seminar. And this seminar is based on the uh, estimating the impact of a financial crisis on your investments. See, avoiding the downside is actually more important than maximizing the returns on the upside. And I've always kind of known that. I mean, we've talked about that for years on this show. We've talked about drawdowns and recovery periods. Most people don't know what that means. Uh, but what they do understand is that, look, let's say you start off and you've got an account in your portfolio. And just for just to keep my math simple, I'm going to use $100,000 because it's easy for me to do percentages with that. So if it's down 50% the way that it was, if you'd invested in November of 2007, all the way through March of 2009, the peak to trough decline there was a little over 50%. The S&P 500, most mutual funds were down that much or more. Not all of them, but the vast majority. And so you got a 50% decline. 100,000 would be $50,000 or a million would be 500,000. Okay. So that's how much you go now to go from 500,000 or to go from 50,000 to a hundred thousand, 500,000 to a million or 50,000 to a hundred thousand, you have to go up a hundred percent. You have to make a 100% gain to get your money back. That's pretty tough. And it did it. It only took it several years, multiple years, as a matter of fact, but eventually it did it. Now it's at a new high and everyone's, Hey, okay. So let's say, you had 50% of your money in stock funds, 50% of your money in short-term bond funds that really didn't fluctuate much at all, and you were only down about 25%. So your 100000 is only 75000 Your million dollars is 750000 okay. A lot better than 500000 Still uncomfortable? Yep. But it's not half. That's really uncomfortable. Okay. So and now let's say... By the time the S&P recovers, it's got to go up 100%. It's got to go up 100%. And then you're finally back to break even. Hopefully, you didn't need to spend any money to live on because you're never going to recover. That's why we don't do that at, at Bullington Capital. That's why you shouldn't be doing that. If you're pulling money out of the account to supplement your income, you should not be 100% invested in stocks uh, unless you're able to pull out you know, a half a percent or so and live on that or something like that. So anyway, that's another story. We'll come back to that later. So I, I, I put my hundred thousand in and went down to 50. By the time it recovers, I've gone up a hundred percent. So if I had half of my money in stocks, half something in safe, I was only down to $75,000. And by the way, I'm rebalancing my portfolio, which means, and, and this was not, uh, I wasn't, um, rebalancing in the, in the, Example I was giving. Let's say I, let, let's forget the rebalancing thing right now. Let's just say you're 50 50. Okay. So the 50% that uh, the total portfolio has got to go up by, I'm sorry, the uh, yeah, to go from 75,000 to 100,000 is 25,000. That's only 33%. It's only 33%. That's interesting because you have to go up hundred percent to get back to break even if you're hundred percent in stock. And if you're 50, 50, you only have to go up 33%. Which do you think is easier? The 33% increase or the 100? <laughs> so if your entire portfolio, your entire portfolio lagged the market all the way up, you'd have still gotten back by the time the market recovered back to hundred thousand, you would be, at 112,000 or 1.12 million. Think about that. Isn't that cool? It, you don't have to take on a lot of risk. You actually beat the market by only making half the market's returns. Isn't that awesome? Now, now, by the way, when the market shot up, if you're comparing yourself from the bottom in March of 2009, or you're looking over the past one or two or three years, see, that's, that's the mistake. That's the mistake that most people make. 
They look at the market when it's done well and said, oh, I should have done better than that or I should have kept up with that. No, you don't have to do that. To come out ahead in the long run, you don't have to do that. And I, this really explained a lot to me too, thinking under those conditions. And so, by the way, when you, when you think you're done learning in this business, I've been doing this for 30 years and I'm still learning. This is a different approach to the same problem that I've been talking about for forever. And you know what? I got to give credit where credit is due. This came to me through BlackRock, one of the world's largest um, money managers. Actually, I think they are the largest, somewhere over five trillion. Huge. And that's what they were talking about. And I was wondering how these pension funds had such really good long-term track records. I mean, I knew that what they were they were investing in stocks, bonds, cash, commodities, all kinds of stuff. They were had a bunch of PhDs and whatnot. And I still think that they actually look just at performance. And I think they they overweight that, the performance. I think, and now, by the way, BlackRock has kind of taught a whole lot of people that performance is only a part of the issue. A more important part is the amount of risk you're taking. That has a much bigger impact. So I can just see it now. All the all these years, you've, they've always talked about asset allocation explains 95% of portfolio. It, people actually misinterpreted that. And by the way, they knew that. The people that put that message out there knew people were misinterpreting it, They but they they liked that. Asset allocation explains, yeah, so in other words, if you had all your money in the exact right place at the exact right time, you did better than somebody who didn't. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for telling me that. <laughs> the, uh, now all you have to do is get a crystal ball that works and we're all set. Yeah. Uh, so these guys are talking about managing the risk. It's okay to miss out on gains as long as you're not losing as much when the market goes down. And that's a key. That's a key. They really delved deeply into that topic. And it's very helpful. It was very helpful for me. And it's, again, it's something that's a, a, a method of, of looking at and, and examining and thinking. And uh, thanks to those guys for, for pointing that out uh, because it, it's really very helpful. So the trick is uh, try not to lose as much on the way going down. And there are lots of things you can do. That's a, you know, the dividend models come to mind uh, when you start thinking about that. They'll go down. They go down a lot, quite frankly. Uh, but one of the uh, impacts that a dividend has on a portfolio is that at some point in time, that dividend yield becomes very attractive to investors. If the share price keeps dropping, it's got a driver to help it recover a little quicker. So that's not necessarily managing the risk on the downside. It's managing your risk on the recovery side. Now they didn't talk about that. Maybe I should write that down and send it to them. Uh, they can, we can talk about that at their next meeting. Yeah, but it's right along the same lines. You know, and there are certain stocks, there are certain techniques that have a tendency not to get beat up quite as much when the market goes down. So a little bit, can do can go a long way a little bit can go a very long way that's interesting now you will underperform when the market's screaming when the market's really going up fast you're gonna it's gonna beat you you can't have it both ways now or actually you you can kind of have it both ways but the way that you do that is you carry some of the 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 stuff that doesn't move right in line with the stock market with some of the stuff that does. Like if you look at the growth oriented stocks, especially the large cap growth, oriented, that's been the leading category last year. It was up about 30%, 30, 31. Large growth companies, large value companies weren't up anywhere near that. It's about 18, 19. That's kind of what we're talking about here. And the combination of the two actually beat the S and P 500 by a pretty wide margin. So uh, again, it's, it's looking at the, how things interact with one another to reduce your risk and improve your returns in the long run. But in the short run, anything less than four or five years, okay, you, you can underperform and you will underperform from time to time. It's okay. That's okay as long as you're controlling the amount of risk that you're taking. And I've got a, a really simple way of doing this. This is something if, if you didn't want to talk to an, an advisor, you didn't want to work out a strategy and uh, try to stick to it, 
then this is what you could do. You could take the amount of fluctuation you want to see in your portfolio, divide it by two, and that's what you would put your money in. That's how much you would put it into stocks, however you did the stocks fund, funds. doesn't matter. Okay. The vast majority of stocks move together. So if you were, and let me give an example. So let's say you took, uh, you said, I, I think I can handle a 20% fluctuation. Okay. Well, 20% of my portfolio times two is 40. So I'll put 40% of my money into stock funds and 60% I'm going to leave in short-term fixed income, things like, you know, government-backed securities that don't have a long maturity on them. Okay. And guess what? Uh, you'd probably be one of those people that ends up doing better than the average investor over your lifetime. Now they hear the music, that means I got to quit. This is Bill Bullington. I'm here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon. You can reach me by going to my website at bullingtoncapital.com. Sign up for that seminar. It's free. Uh, have a good week, everybody. Good luck and good investing. Every Saturday at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and you'd like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or online at BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC.